Well, we are, as I'm sure you remember, <laughs> uh, dealing with our sixth bridge today. We have been approaching the Bible through this year with some interruptions along the way, but nevertheless, we are not discouraged. We just keep going. Um, we've, we're seeing it in terms of seven bridges that move us from one level of spiritual awareness to another. Always upward, always expansive, and never ever backward. Once we cross the bridge, there's no going back. And I know because I've tried several times to get back to the, this consciousness that said, this isn't your fault, you're a victim of the world, and it's just, it felt more comfortable, but I couldn't get back to that. Once you leave it, you've left it. The other thing to keep in mind, my good friend uh, and great teacher, Barbara Marks Hubbard, teaches that the spiritual journey that this is all about is not a straight line. It circles around and around. It's, a, it's cyclical, cyclical. Which means that at different times we come back to the same place, but we're at a different perspective. We're, we're, in, we're in a different place on that new space. You know, you see what I mean? So we see some really, some repetition as the cycle continues, as these six bridges continue to guide us. So we've been across the bridge from the Garden of Eden into this human experience. And we saw that it was our uh, urge to create, to be creative, that led us to take that step. We just weren't content in the garden. We weren't meant to be content in the garden. Spirit had always had more in mind for us than that, and so we, we trust that instinct, and we are invited across that first bridge. Now, some people think we were kicked across the first bridge. That's not so. God does not punish Adam and Eve. God makes them aware that the choice they made, which he <coughs> wanted them to make, needed them to make, is going to cause difficulty. You're going to want, you want to be creative, fine, creation hurts. Giving birth hurts. You want to be self-sufficient, okay, fine. Growing crops is hard work. Not as punishment, but just as you need to be aware of this. And then he makes little clothes for them and dresses them up and packs a suitcase for them and sends them on their way and follows them every step of the way so that when there's a lesson to be learned, there's, there's spirit interceding to say, okay, now, see, if you should kill your brother, that's going to create problems. You know? And so we learn, and we become accustomed to this human experience. And then the second, the second bridge takes us into Egypt. And we said that Egypt represents the height of accomplishment on, in this world, in this dimension. The height of, um, of everything, of sciences, of the arts, of mathematics, everything um, in Egypt is the greatest and, and the most enormous. You can still get that sense when you visit Egypt today. It's kind of intimidating, you know. I much prefer the ruins in Greece because they feel more human, but in Egypt they're just so overwhelming. And we are a part of that. And, f and we are welcome to be a part of it. We sow their crops, we build their monuments, we enjoy all of the acceptance that we receive there until suddenly we're, we wake up one morning and discover that we're addicted to the experiences that we once thought we were choosing because they were pleasant and they felt good and they were affirming. All of a sudden, doing the same thing, getting up and going to work the same way for the same job is suddenly slavery. I'm not doing it because I choose to, because I want to, because it feels fulfilling. I'm doing it because I have to. I have no choice. And that's an awareness that causes us to turn within and find that Moses energy within us 
that says it doesn't have to be this way. Spirit is saying, let my people go. And so the next bridge is out of Egypt and into the wilderness. Bummer. Huh? We weren't expecting wilderness. We were expecting promised land. We were expecting bonbons and chocolates under, sitting under trees and watching you know, television. No, it's not that. Thank God. Well, yeah, perhaps. As, as you know. uh, those of us who are in mourning for the end of Game of Thrones would differ with that, but that was not. <laughs> We're driving across there, and Sean said, all of a sudden, he said, do you realize that we have to face a Sunday night without Game of Thrones? <laughs> we, both, we both panicked for a while, but we'll, we managed to get over it. So we move into the wilderness, into a dimension we weren't expecting, we are supported, we have manna every morning, we, we are encouraged, we are guided along the way by a pillar of fire or a plume of smoke. Uh, so it's not that we're lost in the wilderness, we're just there until it's time to not be there anymore. It's 40 years, 40 is that number of completion. We're in the wilderness as long as it takes. And how, what, how long does it take? Well, it takes one entire generation to die in the wilderness. Because that generation was the generation that was always looking back to Egypt and saying, oh, we should never have left. We had it better there. Even slavery in Egypt is better than this manna. It's going to make me sick if I eat any more of it. And who, who is this man that we're following anyway? And who, who, you know, does anybody, who are his people? And how do we know that he knows what he's talking about? And the people murmured. We hear that. We hear that. We hear that throughout. Genesis, throughout the story, throughout Exodus, the people murmured against Moses and against God. Uh, but they trudged along, they kept going, until the next generation grew up, and they didn't know Egypt, they didn't remember Egypt. So they began to look ahead and say, what, what could be next? Let's see what's next, let's see what's around that next curve. And that's the generation that made the bridge into the promised land. Now, again, the promised land isn't what we thought it was going to be. The promised land simply means that's where our work is to be done. That's where we plant our crops. It's not where manna is shut off the minute we cross the Jordan River. That's a wonderful point made in Exodus. The, the manna disappears. It's now up to us to take care of ourselves, to nurture our crops, to raise our families and to begin to be comfortable again in this human experience as we were before Egypt and to, op to be available to our spiritual purpose in ways that we weren't remotely aware of in the past. Now we do this well and we do it badly. We go through experiences positive and negative. We Remember our, com our spiritual commitment, our creative commitment. After all, we are here to be creative. And we forget that sometimes. And we get distracted by other things, you know, by um, other gods. The god down the road where they do, you know, they have sex practices. That sounds like a fun place to join. I may sign up there. Um, there are all kinds of things that distract us. And we get totally, we totally lose our spiritual focus until we come to a moment of crisis. Now, I'm sure none of you have ever <laughs> felt yourself adrift until you come to a moment of crisis and say, oops, you know. But we do. We come to a moment of crisis, we call for help, and that, that help always arises. The guidance arises within us, just as Moses did. Deborah arises, or Gideon arises, or Samson arises, and, and we are guided out of that immediate danger, and we're always intensely grateful, and we say, oh, that uh, that will never happen again, I will, you know, I've learned my lesson, I will tithe every week, and I will go to church, and I will volunteer work, and, you know, I'm going to be a changed person, and we are that for a while, and then we forget again, and we drift. Finally, we say, you know what we need? We need someone to take charge of this for us. You know, I'm, I'm tired of being in charge of my own life. 
I'm tired of having to make a decision every day as to whether I honor spirit or not. I need somebody who can do that for me. Now, our, our spiritual guidance, Samuel, says, no, not a good idea. You don't need an intercessor, intercessor between you and God. You have the guidance you need here. You don't need anything else. You have your own connection to the divine. You don't need someone to tell you what the divine wants you to do or how that kingdom should express. We say, no, 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 no. This is a good idea. We're going to elect a king. And we do. We choose kings. And things work swimmingly. I mean, we become a great nation. We become very successful in the world. And the same weird sort of thing. It's, it's like Egypt again, isn't it? We're functioning in the world and comfortable with it and ex experiencing benefits from it. And then the same weird thing happens. All of a sudden, the king says, you know what I need? I need a palace. You know what God wants? God wants you to build him a temple. And all of a sudden, we are conscripted and we are slaves again. Saying, wait a minute. This isn't how this is supposed to happen. And we get stuck in that mentality again. And this time, Spirit says to us collectively, what you need is a time out. What you need is you need to be able to look at this. You need a different perspective. So along come the Babylonians who cooperate by enslaving us and carting us off to Babylon. Where we are, well, we're slaves, but we're not like, it's not like Egypt. We have a lot more freedom than that. Um, it's just that we can't go home. We can't leave. We're under strict, you know, we're like undocumented immigrants. Just, we, no, but we can't, we're limited in what we can do. And then comes Cyrus, the king of Persia. Are you paying attention to all of this? This is a great... <laughs> Along comes Cyrus, and Cyrus conquers the Babylonians, and Cyrus, who is the only non-Jew called the beloved of God in the entire Hebrew scripture, because he says, if you want to go home, go home. I don't care. He had a whole different approach to how to manage the diverse people that he was conquering. He, would, he basically left them to their own traditions and their own devices and just said, you know, send me the tax money and we'll be fine with all of this. <laughs> and that becomes the sixth bridge, back. Back from exile. And something strange and important and wonderful has happened in Babylon and affects us as we continue forward. Up until that point, we were being, we were dealing with things collectively. God spoke to all of us and, as fire and flames, and, and it, we, it was a collective experience. We were collectively told by the king what to do, what not to do. Now, this bridge is a bridge of individuation. Each of us gets to decide, do you want to go back or do you want to stay here? Because for a lot of people, exile had become pretty comfortable. You know, they found work, they found, they raised a family, and they weren't... And a generation grew up that had never been to Jerusalem, so why should I schlep through the desert to go to Jerusalem? You know, that doesn't make any sense at all. And that's where we step into the time of the prophets. The prophets come out of that individuation. They are not, they are not um, speaking to crowds, speaking to all of us at once. They are ex sharing their own personal experience. They're not pointing to a God out there and saying, this is what God wants. They're saying, basically, the message of the prophet is this. If you continue to make the choices you're making, you will continue to have the results you have. And that, by and large, is what they have to say. It's up, you have choices to make. And your choices will determine how your life unfolds. I just feel, because we haven't looked at, actually looked at the Bible for a while, I felt the need to uh, look at a passage out of Isaiah this week. See if I can finesse this. Do I help? No, I think I can. This is second Isaiah. I don't want to go into all of that, but there are three, at least three voices in the book that we call Isaiah. There is Isaiah the prophet, 
who lived before the exile and spent his time predicting that that's what would happen. Uh, that if you continue to rely on, especially his big thing was if you continue to rely on foreign alliances, if you continue to look for power and support elsewhere in the world, you're, you're in for trouble. And indeed they, they were. Second Isaiah comes along after the, the generation in exile, and his second Isaiah's job is to encourage people to leave. Please, come back to Jerusalem, come back to your homeland, come back to where you can do your spiritual work. Thus says the Lord, in a time of favor have I answered you. On a day of salvation I have helped you. I have kept you and given you as a covenant to the people to establish the land, to apportion the desolate heritages, saying to the prisoners, come out. To those who are in darkness, show yourselves. They shall feed along the ways, on all the bare heights shall be their pasture. They shall not hunger or thirst. Neither scorching wind nor sun shall strike them down, for he who has pity on them will lead them, and my springs of water will guide them. And I will turn all my mountains into a road, and my highways shall be raised up. Lo, these shall come from far away, and lo, these from the north, and these from the west, and these from the land of Syen. Sing for joy, O heavens, and exult, O earth. Break forth, O mountains, into singing, for the Lord has comforted his people and will have compassion on his suffering ones. Isn't that beautiful? And the powerful message, trust in the Lord. Now, we've said before that in Hebrew scripture, the word is Lord. You can substitute Christ, and the, and the message is still as clear as day. Because the Lord is not a God out there somewhere. It's often called the Lord of your being. It is your own connection to the divine. That's what you have to trust. And that is calling you forward always, always, always on your spiritual path. Always. Everything else is fear-based ego thought. You know, yes, but what if this? Yes, but what if that? You don't know that. You don't know who knows from Jerusalem's probably a mess. It wouldn't be any place to live. All of those practical negative energies that the ego loves to throw in our way, right? But we do pay attention. We decide to take the step and we head back into our own homeland, into discovering the work that is ours to do, discovering our own connection. From this point on, God never, well, God itself, as the wholeness of God, never appears and never speaks to large crowds of people. From here on in, it's very personal. The Bible becomes very personal. And God itself, the, the, the allness of God, sort of disappears. Books have been written um, about what, what happens to God in, in Hebrew scripture and then into, into Christian scripture because the the massive presence of God that Abraham experienced, that Isaac and Joseph experienced, and Moses, that's no longer there. And the question is, has God changed somehow? Has God gone away? Has God, you know, is God dead, as Time Magazine so famously asked on this cover? Uh, and the answer is no, 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 no. God is God. God is what God is. God is all that is. What changes is our perspective. What changes is our ability to know ourselves as the divine. To know ourselves so that we don't need massive intrusions from without. We are, it becomes a very personal connection. And God speaks individually to prophets and then through the prophets to individuals and to people. And, and they express opinions, but they don't, it's not a, Massive, you all have to do the same thing. It's a personal decision now. It's up to you. Do you want to express your spiritual self? Do you want to discover your spiritual truth? Or don't you? Um, and this, I think, is very much kind of where we are today, don't you think? Um, I, don't mean, I don't mean to sound judgmental. I never, never mean to sound judgmental. Although I do. But... I never... <laughs> but the world today seems to be divided between those people 
who are staying in Babylon, who are still staying beyond that bridge and don't want to cross it, or even, even staying in the pre-exile pre mentality. People who still think that the most important thing they have to worry about is money, status, power, these human things that we, for the most part, we have learned are not the answer to anything really, right? And then here we are knowing that that won't work anymore uh, and yet unable to make it go away and unable to change their minds. Haven't you ever talked to somebody and just wish you could reach inside their head and shake their brain a little bit until they, they see the light? But that's not how it works. We, ha we are the cutting edge. We are the forerunners of the next spiritual dimension. And the time is at hand. I know I sound like a prophet myself, and I think in, to some extent I'm beginning to think I am. Rather than being a minister, I think I'm a prophet. I was signed, as you know, I'm right, I've been signed to write for Daily Word. I write for Unity uh, website. I write for Unity Publications. I'm working on the Lenten one now. And just this week, they asked me, and I agreed to write a, a bi-monthly Bible column for Unity magazine. And I think, this is really interesting. I'm, I, my ministry is turning into something I never would have expected. You know? Um, and it's more of a prophet kind of role than anything else. It's, I, don't, I don't have to go to board meetings, so I'm not a minister. If you don't have to go to board meetings, you're not a minister. <laughs> but, and I don't, I don't think there's any... I don't, I'm not meaning to praise or pat myself on the back when I say I'm a prophet, because it's not always a pleasant thing to be. Um, it's not always pleasant to speak truth when the, in, you know, in the face of people who are quite comfortable with the lie, with the illusion. It can be very, it can be very painful. It can be very painful to deal with something like the, the hurricane experience this week and hang on to principle. There are no victims. And there is no absence of God anywhere. Anywhere. Did God make it happen? I don't, don't think we believe that for a minute. Did we make it happen? Well, kind of we did. With our own negative energies, with our own belief in uh, the realities of the weather and the realities of, of this planet as something that cannot be changed. Uh, we said, okay, that has to happen because these factors have come together and so it, it's inevitable that it happened. And it's difficult it, because you sound so unsympathetic, but it's not unsympathetic at all. I mean, you do what you can to help and to heal. At the same time, you know the truth, that in truth, no help, no healing is necessary. It is not needed. And this is what we're beginning to find out. This is our next dimension of awareness which is that there is nothing to change. There is, we are not to use our powers to make the world a better place. The world is perfect as it is at this moment. You know that? It is perfect as it is at this moment. We are not here to experience the kingdom of heaven here on earth. We're here to experience the the vicissitudes of, of the world, the challenges of being alive, the challenges of being human, so that choice by choice by choice, we create the new consciousness that is the kingdom of heaven. And we're getting to a point where for fleeting moments we can experience that. You know, if you're seeing a, a sunrise or if you're or, or in, the, in the middle of a, of a meditation, uh, you just can get a glimpse of a consciousness that says everything is just exactly perfect. Everything, how can it be not perfect? Because everything is God in expression, right? And God can't be imperfect, that's not a possibility. The allness cannot be an imperfect allness. It, our perception of it can be imperfect. Our understanding of it our ability to use it, to call upon it, to allow the presence of God that we truly are to be the creative being that we truly are, you know, that can be a challenge. 
But there is perfection in everything. That's why I've said so often that my, my oh, really my only mantra today is show me the good. Don't, I'm not going to judge what's happening. I'm not going to say that's bad. Show me how to get over it. That's good. Show me how to get more of it. Show me the good. Just show me the good in whatever is happening. And it doesn't isolate me from anything, but it gives me peace in my heart to know that whatever I'm going through is mine to go through. And the choices I'm being called to make are choices that will make a difference. Every choice is creating the kingdom or is not creating the kingdom when we get to this level of consciousness that we share. Everything is either moving us toward or away from the kingdom of heaven. So that is our choice. Show me the good. Show me the choice that will help create the kingdom. Show me how this choice can add to everybody else's positive choices and loving choices. And together we can, we can heal. You know, I don't care how many years and billions they say it will take. Texas will heal when we decide we're ready to heal it. And the, in the process, we will learn, we, will, we already are, gaining rich insights into how much love there is in our hearts and how superficial the differences between black and white, gay and straight, um, those just go away. They, don't, they become totally unimportant. And people are just, how can I help? You know, how can I help you as a human being? How can I help you as a spiritual being move through this human experience? So think about that this week. Think, you know, Work on being conscious of your choices. And know that you are always either creating the kingdom or holding back from creating the kingdom. And it's okay. You know, that's okay too. Spirit is not in any hurry. There's no time in spirit. So this is not taking longer or shorter, less time than it should. It's do, it is unfolding as it should. And we are unfolding it as we are meant to unfold it. But please know what an incredibly important part you have in all of this. Each of you, all of us. Um, know the incredible power that happens when we come together, even in this, a room that is very intimate, even with numbers that are not huge. The power of our coming together is infinite. Mm -hmm. The power we sent to Texas this morning is infinite. Mm -hmm. And it is having its effect even as we speak. So be aware of your choices and be aware that in every case, when you get stuck, when you get stumped, show me the good. Blessings. Oh,